couldn't have done that better myself. Last week, if you remember, we were in the book of James, and it was not a nice verse that we read. It started off, the book uh, of James chapter 4, verse number 4, said, Ye adulterers and adulteresses. How many of you remember that? That was very stark, wasn't it? We learned that it was the, the spiritual application of a very physical truth to be unfaithful to a spouse in the world uh, that we live in. Of course, according to the Bible, it's called adultery, isn't it? And we know that to be unfaithful to our Heavenly Father after we are a child of God is to be spiritually an adulterer. And we learned that the fact was that the love of the world automatically makes us an enemy of God. In other words, I use the, the verse in Scripture that says, if you're not gathering for me, you are scattering. And remember we had Cuz up here, and he was the one gathering uh, and putting in the barn, and I was the one taking out of the barn and throwing it out. You guys remember all of that. What I'm saying tonight, this morning, is that there is no place for a Christian who simply feels like they are on the sidelines or they're just not going to do anything. You're either for God or you're against God. There's no in-between. That's the point that we're making. The, the algorithm that God gave us in the book of James was that love of the world, friendship with the world, is an enemy of God. They are, they are absolutely opposite. The pathway of the world and the pathway of God do not run parallel. And you cannot serve both. Now this morning, I, I wasn't intending to take this any further, but the Lord led this week as I was reading, and I, I came across... 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number, uh, verse number 10. And it struck me again the importance of, of emphasizing the truth of this matter of the love of the world versus the love of God. And I emphasized last week that many times we don't learn things the first time. If you're like me, it took me a long time to learn certain concepts in math and in English. I've said before that I've never understood English better than when I started teaching it. Because I had to teach it, and I'm telling you, you better understand it if you're going to teach it. And things just made sense to me that I had no idea before, and I just couldn't understand them. And, and that's the way it is with the Word of God. As we begin to exercise them and review them in our lives, what we find is they become true to us. Not just true because it's the Word of God, but now they become a reality in our life that really affects the way we live. And that's my hope with this second, really the second message on a very familiar theme that we started last week, and that is the love of God versus the love of the world. And this is a very material and physical biography of someone that we have in the Scriptures that I want to just take a moment this morning, and I want to study their lives because it helps me when I can see someone that is an example either of good or bad for me. That way I understand maybe where I'm at. And this morning, I want to tell you, that my goal is not to make you angry, it's not to make you frustrated or even hopeless, but my goal this morning would be, by the Word of God, hopefully, to shake you a little bit. Now, I can't walk up to you and grab you by the lapels and shake you and get your attention. I mean, I can, but that wouldn't be very kind. And uh, the, the point I'm trying to make this morning is only the Holy Spirit can do that in your life. And I'm praying this morning that the Holy Spirit would would take you in a loving way and get your attention because this is the importance of what we're talking about this morning. By way of history and background, this, the book of 2 Timothy was written by Paul as he was in a prison in Rome. And he was just about to be executed. A matter of fact, it would be just a, sh a matter of short weeks after the book of 2 Timothy was written that Paul would give his life for the cause of Christ. He would literally be executed, martyred because of his faith. The journey to Rome had been a long one, and Paul had been in prison a couple of different times. During this imprisonment, especially in the book of, uh, or in the in the city of Rome, Paul was given opportunity to make his defense. And when he stood to make his defense, he realized that there was nobody with him. And what he didn't, he didn't mean by that was he didn't have any friends around him. The Bible very clearly says that Luke was with him, and we know he was there. But what he recognized was there's no one here that understands where I'm at and has my best interest in mind apart from God. And that's what he testified later on in, verse, uh, in chapter number 4. 
down and uh, we could go on, verse number 17. But what I'm saying this morning is that Paul is writing this finally after his defense had failed before Caesar and now he was condemned to die and to die as a martyr for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as Paul is writing, he's saying, Timothy, I want you to remember a few things. This is the wonderful passage that he says, I've finished uh, my course, I've kept the faith, I've fought a good fight. He's at the end of his life testifying of the fact that I've done what God's called me to do. I've kept my eyes on the Lord and I've followed Him. But Timothy, I need you to remember some things. Now, it was a little later on where, where Timothy would say to, or Paul would say to Timothy, continue thou in the things which thou hast uh, been given and uh, teach faithful men. And Paul was pouring into Timothy in this way. But he makes one comment in verse number 10 that I think is very stark and troubling. And he mentions a man by the name of Demas. And Demas was a man that we had heard just a little bit from before. Would you hold your Bible there in first, excuse me, Second Timothy? Would you turn back toward the front of the Bible just a few pages to the book of Colossians? Just a few pages back, you find the book of Colossians chapter 4. Notice if you would in verse 14. Time would fail me this morning to go back and to talk about the men and women that he had mentioned, Paul had mentioned here in the previous pas- uh, scriptures, up starting at verse number 7 and coming down. And what you'll find is with every one of these people that are mentioned by the Apostle Paul, there's something that he commends about them. By way of illustration, let me give you a few of them if I can. Notice verse number 9. Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother. Go down to verse number 10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner. And Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom you receive commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. Go down to um, uh, verse number 12, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ. We go on um, uh, down to verse 14, Luke, the beloved physician. Now what, what the common thing is in all of these things is that Paul has made commendation about all of these faithful men and women. But notice if you would in verse 14, he says, and Demas greet you. I'm just surmising here, so don't, don't quote me on this this morning, but I wonder if Paul in the book of Colossians has already begun to see the effects of the love of the world in Demas' life. Every one of the other men, he said, he's my fellow laborer and they, they're doing the right thing and following along, but he just simply lists Demas as one that is with them. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to read into this, but I'm trying to help you to see this morning that I believe maybe there's a process that's happened in Demas's life whereby he loved the world more than he loved God. I'm not going to take you over to the book of Philemon, but he's mentioned again there in Philemon. I believe Philemon was even earlier than Colossians. And Philemon, in, in the book of Philemon, Paul mentions Demas as a fellow laborer. So what I'm saying is if we follow these small little truths about the, the, the uh, appearance of Demas in the Bible, we find that there seems to be a progression from being a fellow laborer, someone who is involved in the work of the Lord, now to just simply being present, just simply being there, not really having any effect at all, to finally in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number, four, uh, verse number 10, he has forsaken me having loved this present work. Now, I'm just saying this morning that we look at the book of 2 Timothy and Paul is giving us a glimpse into this man and the study of this man shows us that there may be one who has joined in to this service of the Lord and with the Apostle Paul, well, wouldn't that be exciting? I'm telling you to travel with Paul and to see all that was going on, that's amazing. I think it would be amazing to travel along with that evangelist and see God work. And, but, but, you know, i got to remind you today that Paul wasn't just uh, glitz and glamour, was it? Matter of fact, he was very little glitz and glamour. Doesn't, it, it seemed like no matter where he went, he got himself into trouble. He'd go into, he'd go into Lystra and he got himself stoned. He'd get on a ship and he'd find himself shipwrecked and floating in the water for three days. He'd find himself going in certain places and, and preaching. And man, they would haul him into the synagogue and, and uh, beat him and all kinds of stuff. I mean, it just seemed like everywhere Paul was going, he was making enemies. But if you understood something about Paul, you saw that his life was not only fruitful, but it was being blessed of God. And it was exciting to see. I want you to understand tonight, or this morning, that Paul wasn't saying, Demas has forsaken me as a personal friend. 
It, it wasn't about the fact that he was following Paul. It was about the fact that Paul's life was directly influenced and related to following and loving the Lord. So what I'm saying today is Paul was a representative of the life that God wanted Demas to live. Paul was very different in his mindset. Paul did not have a love of the world. As a matter of fact, he, he said, all those things that I count gain to me, I count but loss. In other words, all those things that I gather to myself, and he listed some of those things. He had a degree, and I'm sure if he would put that on his wall, people would ooh and awe at his degree that he had. He was, he was graduated from the best school in Jerusalem, Gamaliel School. And I'm telling you, he was not just graduated, but he was top of his class. And when he was um, working for the Lord, I mean, you talk about zeal, and you talk about what he's going to do, and, and, and all of these things that he could have accumulated to himself. He said, those things I count but loss. Why? So that I may know Christ. All right, so the mindset of Paul was, the world can have all of its stuff. The world can have all of its philosophies. I love God, and I'm going to follow God. All right, so that was Paul's direction. Here comes Demas, and I'm sure for a little bit, Demas was like, man, let's go. And he was a fellow laborer, and I'm sure he was one that was looked on and said, man, he's a promising young man, and he's doing some great things, and that's a wonderful opportunity. And you know what? We may look around today and see some of our young men and ladies sitting here today and say, man, they look promising, and they look around, and you could feel really good about the fact that they're dressed up and looking nice, and they're respectful and saying, okay, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, whatever the case might be. And uh, man, uh, they've got a promising future in front of them. But let me tell you, young people, what makes it promising. It's not the fact that you know how to do all the right things and say all the right words. It's that you have a love for God that never stops. And that your love for God is what's primary in your life, and that's what directs what you do in your life. That's the decisions that you make. That's what makes the difference. Because what happened to Demas, and I'm not saying Demas was an awful wicked person, but I'm just saying that he lost his fruitfulness. And by the way, I don't know any many people that name their children Demas. Do you? I'm not, again, I don't know him as a charactered person, but all we know in Scripture is one thing, that Demas loved this present world and forsake the Apostle Paul. And that poor guy, I'm sure he's in heaven today, but man, I tell you what, to be known like that for the rest of eternity has got to be hard. But here's what I'm trying to say this morning. Demas had an opportunity to love God, but when he got with the Apostle Paul, what he began to see was my direction and the Apostle Paul's direction are not compatible. Can I make this down to maybe just a little bit more personal today? Maybe, maybe it's not a person, but you just say, you know what, my direction and the direction of my parents just aren't the same. Or my direction and the direction of what it appears that our church is going in just doesn't seem the same. And so what happens is that a person looks at the world and they look at God or the representation of God, maybe through parents or the church, and they say, you know what, I think I'm going to go that direction. And young people, I'm telling you this morning, it happens and it's happened over and over again. And I'm telling you this morning that the reason it's happened is because of 2 Timothy 4 and verse number 10. The fact is, you only love one thing. We mentioned that last week. You cannot love God and be friends with the world at the same time. There is no middle ground. There is no neutrality. You cannot do both things. You have to choose. And it's almost like I want to say to uh, parents or to children or whoever, the young people, listen, it's not about just kind of making things go along for a little time. You need to make your choice. Either you're going to love God with your whole heart and follow Him, or you're going to love the world and follow it. You can't pretend to do both. Believe me, I tried. And I know there's a lot of people that have tried. And there may be some people today who are trying. There may be some adults who are trying to serve the world and to love the world and love God at the same time. We want to hold on to this because we understand the importance of it, but we also want to hold on to this because we like how it makes us feel or we like what it brings us. And I'm saying today you cannot love both. You cannot love God and love the world because what we see in the life of Demas, ultimately he chose to follow the world and left Paul who was a representation of the way, I believe, of the Lord. And so, 
by the time Paul is in prison, the second and final time, he mentions to Timothy, he said, Demas has forsaken me because he loved this present world. Now, I want to look at this man, Demas, if I can, for just a moment. I've given you a bit of in, in, uh, introduction, but let me just speak, if I can, briefly on this matter of loving the world. My friend, this morning, if you're sitting here today and you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, you've been born again into God's family. May I tell you something? Whether you like it or not, and I don't want to make that oppositional or controversial, but here's the bottom line. You need to give God your entire life and, and affections. Now, I'm not saying this morning that we can't have things in this world. Believe me, I thank the Lord for the fact that I can drive a car around and I can live in a house. I'm thankful for the things God gives me. I'm thankful for the privileges that God gives me. By the way, you cannot compare to the blessing of serving the Lord and giving Him your whole life. God gives you everything you want in the first place. It's amazing to me. I felt like literally when I was a 14-year-old boy and I was at the crossroads of my life, literally having to make a decision about whether I'm going to give God my life or whether I'm going to keep my life for myself, I, I was scared to death. Let me tell you why. I thought if I gave God my life and I said, Lord, I'm going to serve you, I'm going to do what you, whatever you want me to do, I thought, sure, he was going to make my life miserable. I mean, I could think of all kinds of stuff to think about. You know, all kinds of misery and trouble and all kinds of difficulty. Man, I just thought it was awful. That scared me. It wasn't like I'm rebellious and I don't want to do it. I just, I just didn't think it was going to be any fun. But can I tell you, I was doing a little bit of research. It's amazing to me. I graduated college in 1998. All you little kids are like, Ugh. I had a daughter. Can you believe this? This week asked me, Dad, were you alive in 1981? I said, I'll have you know, I was born in 1976. She said, wow. <laughs> I'm telling you, the nerve of these kids. Unbelievable. So, I don't even remember where I was going with all that. <laughs> here's what I was saying. The fact is, when I gave God my life, I was afraid. Now, here's what I was going with that. I, I graduated college, Bible college in 1998. For those of you that are counting, that's a long time ago. I realized I have literally been serving the Lord since 1998. And I'm talking about in a full-time fashion. I'm not saying everybody has to, but that's been my direction. And I'll tell you what, God has given me such a full life. I, if I could go back to my 14-year-old self, I would take my 14-year-old self by the lapels and say, Joel, you have nothing to worry about. Matter of fact, it's going to be better than you could even imagine. If God told me I'd be happily married 22 years later with six great kids and pastoring a great church and serving the Lord and seeing God work, I would have never believed it. Not only those things, and, and I'm not telling you that this, uh, there's been problems and difficulties. There's been growth and, and, and turmoil and difficulties. But what I'm saying is serving the Lord, loving Him, and giving Him everything has been more than I could have ever asked for. Now, you don't have to take my word for it. I'm just a guy standing up here. What do I care? What do you care about what I'm doing? I'm saying you can taste and see as well. God is good, and if you love him with your whole heart, serve him. And Demas, having loved this world, instead of finding what God can do and understanding the blessing of God, he goes his own way into his life to serve the world. I'll talk about that in just a moment. What the reason is, is because he loved this present world. As we learned last week, you cannot love the world and love God at the same time. And the sad thing for this man is that when we understand his decision, then we understand that he lost the potential for fruitfulness in his life. Now, what is meant by the, the phrase, this present world? If you look in verse number 10, he has disparted me, he's forsaken me, having loved this present world. I, I was interested in what that meant. The world here is this idea of uh, uh, excuse me, let's talk about the word love, that I, and you probably know what the word love means, but here it's dealing with the idea of to welcome or to entertain, to be fond of, literally to be well pleased with, or to be contented with. All right, so he loved, he, he embraced what? This present world. Now think with me about that just a minute. What does that mean? Did, did he embrace the trees? I, I, you know, did he embrace nature? No, that's not what we, we're talking about. The world that we're talking about here is man's creations, the philosophies, and the institutions, and the, and the religions, and the pursuits 
And all of the things that make up the world today, what makes up the world? What drives us as a human race to get up in the morning and to do things that we're doing? What is it that drives us to go and do things? I want to tell you at the very foundation of it all is really the pursuit to make ourselves more comfortable and to feed whatever desires that we have. I'm not going to take you back this morning to the book of Ephesians. You're probably familiar with that book of chapter 2. The Bible says that we walked according to the course of this world, fulfilling the lusts of our flesh. Now that's what characterizes people today. You know what makes my neighbors get up and do what they're doing? Because they want to do what they want to do. I'll tell you, that characterizes my flesh too. Because that's what I want to follow. And if I'm a child of God, I've got a choice. I can either choose to follow what I want to do or I can follow what God wants me to do. Now, the unsaved, the lost world today, they don't have that choice. They only have one master, and it is themselves. By default, then, it's Satan. What I'm saying this morning is that the love of this world is to embrace the things of this world. Now, that can look very sim- uh, simple, look very innocent. Here's what I'm talking about. You know, climbing a particular ladder in your career is not a bad thing. But I'll tell you, if that's your pursuit and that's your love, you've got your affections in the wrong place. It may be that you're thinking about um, maybe possessions. And, and it's not, I don't care what happens at work, man. I just want to get my and whatever. I want to build this or do this or whatever it might be. And so you embrace, you love whatever that is, that possession. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a person that you uh, love to be around. And by the way, relationships aren't bad. God's created us as a relational being. I'm thankful for good relationships. But I understand also that relationships can come above the love of God. Now, I'm thankful this morning that the relationships that are right and in balance never conflict with our love for God. I love my wife more than today that I've ever loved her before in my life. Then I'm thankful that doesn't conflict with my love for God. Because relationships that are right and in the right time, in the right order, in the right place, they don't conflict with the love of God. But what I'm saying this morning is, if we're in a relationship or we have a a, a friendship or an acquaintance that's not right, it will cause your heart to be turned away. And that love for that, if you choose to love this relationship more than you love God, it will cause you to turn away. Now, I'm just saying this morning, it could be anything. It could be money. It could be fame or whatever. I want to I rise up in this. I want to be influential in this. And listen, those things are not bad. It, the money's not the problem. Influence isn't the problem. Possessions aren't the problem. It is the pursuit and love of those things that are the problem. My question today is, what are you serving? What do you love? And the love of this world had caused Demas to walk away. And by the way, he said this present world. I love the fact that he quantifies it as this present world. Here's what that means. There is a world that is not present. There is a world that is future. And I want you to see the difference between the future world and the present world. The future world is unseen as of yet. That is, we cannot perceive it with our God-given senses. We have five Eyes and ears and nose and mouth and fingers. We can't see that world to come. And it is a spiritual world. It's a very real world. As a matter of fact, it's going to be very material in God's kingdom. But let me tell you, it is right now unseen. But I'll tell you for sure, it is no less real than the world we're living in today. The Bible says it this way, the things that are seen, you fill in the blank, are what? temporal, if you didn't know that, that means temporary. They will not last. But the things which are unseen are, and fill in the blank, eternal, that is permanent. Now that does not make sense to our human minds. And I'll tell you, this is why pastors and preachers of the Bible get such a bad rap, because people look at me, you're nuts, pastor. Let me tell you, we may be nuts, but the Bible is the word of God, and I'm just going to tell you this, The things that you see right now are not going to last. All the things that you're putting your time and your effort and your your affections into, they're not going to last. What's going to last are the things that we cannot see, the things that we cannot touch and feel right now and perceive with our senses. So the question is, which one are you going to embrace? 
Demas decided he was going to embrace the things that he could see. I don't know that he went off into deep sin. I don't know that Demas went off into some immorality. All I know is that Demas loved the world and decided to go that way. It might have been a job pursuit. Maybe he had a job opportunity. Maybe he had a, a family or a friend. Maybe he had a girlfriend in Thessalonica. I don't know. Maybe, maybe he had some um, a hobby or whatever. A and he just decided, I'm going to love that more than I love God. And so having to make that decision, he forsook Paul in his time of need. Now, I'm saying this morning, you, you might say to yourself, well, I'm not like that. I, I love God. And I, I, love, I love God, and I would even say I love God first. Here's the problem. Here's what I want to do. Sometimes it's good for us to take an assessment of our life. How many of you understand that? Now, if, if, I was, if you ask me, what kind of a person are you? I'll tell you I'm the best person I know. Matter of fact, my sin is not nearly as bad as yours. <laughs> right? I mean, how many are with me? I'm being facetious in that, and you would all say the same thing. I was thinking about that the other day. We, there was something that I was thinking about, I feeling convicted about something, and I realized, wow, you know, it doesn't look as bad in me as it looks in other people. If I saw what I was doing in someone else, I'd be like, oh. I mean, by, you know, gossip and other things, it's just awful. And we, we never look at each other as bad, uh, excuse me, we never look at ourselves as bad as we look at each other. Now, here's what I'm saying in all that. Sometimes we just need a someone to come and give us an assessment that is objective. So here's what I want to say this morning. How do you know whether you're loving God or loving this world? Well, here's a good question for you. Think about something in your life right now. Maybe it's a job or a whatever. You just name it. It could be a possession. It could be anything that we talked about or anything else. But name something in this world today that you would say, I would not want to do without this. Now, I'm not talking about our necessities. Obviously, we need food and we need protection and clothing. and all. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying the things of this world that you are f focusing on right now, maybe, maybe it's sports, maybe it's um, music, maybe it's entertainment, maybe it's friendship, whatever it is, what is it in this world that you could say, I wouldn't want to do without this? Again, I'm not saying that everything that you may be thinking right now is sinful in and of itself. But my question is, what would you be willing to do without? Or what would you be willing not to do without? And if the answer to that question, hear me out on this, because this is really the bottom line of the message this morning. If the bottom line of that is, I would rather do without anything or everything than be without the Lord Jesus. I think in our hearts there may be something in there that has our affection, the love of the world. May I go back to our family conference a couple weeks ago? Do you remember what was said? That the only way for Satan to have his influence as a stronghold in our life is for us to give him some land. Remember that? The book of 2 Corinthians tells us that. So that land that we give him, he builds strongholds in our life. Let me tell you what I think a big stronghold can be, and that is the love of the world. Because when I have something, and it may not be, l listen, you sitting here today, you all look like perfect saints to me. I mean, you're looking great, you're smiling at me. I mean, uh, what could get any better? But I know like you know, we are not perfect saints. I'm talking about me too. Here's what I'm saying though. At what point do you take a look at yourself and say, there's something here that is far greater than my love for God. I'm not willing to do without this in my life. If I had to give this up today for Jesus, it would kill me. Let me tell you today, that may be the thing, and I'm telling you it is the thing that Satan is using to be a stronghold in your life. You're trying to hold on to that thing and trying to hold on to God, and you're failing at both. Which one are you going to let go of? Are you willing to let go of the things of the world so that you can love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? By the way, the Bible says in Matthew chapter number 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And what does he say? All these things will be added unto you. That's my testimony. Now, I, 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 did, I, don't, I didn't take the path that my life that I thought I was going to take when I was in high school. But can I say, I'm not sad about that. There's not one ounce of regret. And I'm not saying because I'm a pastor. I'm saying 
We have people sitting in our pews that have followed God with their whole heart, and maybe their path hasn't taken the path that they thought it would, but they look back and say, there's no regret. Uh, loving God with all my heart, there's never been any regret. My only regret is the times when I've held on to the world instead of God. Whenever I've let something of the world have my affection, I've followed that and realized how much I've forsaken in God's work. I'm saying this morning that the love of the world will rob us of the opportunities of service of the Lord and will rob us ultimately of true satisfaction and fulfillment because that only comes in the Lord Jesus. Jesus is the answer. That sounds so trite, doesn't it? But I'm telling you, whatever you're dealing with today, Jesus is the answer. You follow the Lord and give Him your whole heart and love Him, and I promise you, God promises you, that there will be a blessing for you. Now, so the question then to this morning is, what are you holding on to that you do not want to let go of? What is it that you would say to, my, to, to the Lord, if I had to give this up for Jesus, if I had to give this up to follow the Lord, it would absolutely kill me. What is it in your life this morning? What is it? And I promise if you're honest with yourself, the Holy Spirit's speaking to you right now. And if you're willing to say, you know what, Lord, I recognize that, that that's my affection right now. I, I mean, I'm a good person. I go to church and all the rest of the stuff. But I see that I'm holding on to something right now that I need to let go of. And I'm not saying you have to quit your job. I, I'm not saying you have to give all your money away or sell all your possessions. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you have to stop loving them and love God. Give God everything in your heart because that's where it matters. Demas just could not get the world out of his heart and mind. And Satan had the resources then to conquer his heart and draw him away from the Lord in the form of the Apostle Paul there. There are many Demases who have been or are now in process of being pulled away by the love of the world. And let me tell you, if, if anything breaks my heart as a pastor, may I tell you this just as, as humanly as I can tell you this morning. Can I, can I just, if you listen to anything, listen to this. If there's anything that breaks the heart of a pastor is to see people that I love and I believe God can do great things with decide to follow after the things of the world rather than God. I, don't, I can't do anything about it other than pray and preach and, and plead, but it, you're, it's your choice. It's my choice. We all have a choice, but I'll tell you it breaks my heart. I'm not trying to put a guilt trip on you, but I'm just saying this. It's a sad thing, and I can imagine Paul. His, I can hear the brokenness in his, in his heart. Demoth has forsaken me. I don't think this was cynical. I don't think it was sarcastic. I don't even think it was hateful. I really believe that it broke Paul's heart. One commentator said this, For brethren, if once this love of the world, which is always soliciting each of us, gets a footing in our hearts, it is impossible as impossible as it is for two bodies to occupy the same place at the same time, it is impossible for the love of Christ, which is the love of God, to continue to be dominant there. There cannot be two masters. That is plain common sense. If my head is full of thoughts and schemes concerned only with the fleeting, illusory present, then there's no room in it for His serene and ennobling presence. If my hands are laden with pebbles, I cannot clasp or grasp the diamonds that are offered to me. I want to tell you that's so often the truth, isn't it? The world has its kind of glitter and, gl and glamour, but what we don't realize is it's just pebbles. God's wanting to give us so much more, but our hands are full. Our head is full. Our hearts are full. We can't have what God has for us. And so, John, uh, excuse me, Demas forsake for, has forsaken me having loved this present world. There's two other men mentioned here, and I was going to do a brief study on them. I'm not going to this morning, but I want to mention their names. One of them is Mark. If you notice there in verse number 11, only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with me, with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Now, there's a stark contrast here, and I've got to give you a little background on Mark, and I'm not going to spend a long time on this, and then I'm going to con conclude this morning. John Mark was one of those young men that was uh, promising, and Paul and Barnabas were setting off on their first missionary journey in the book of Acts, and they decided they're going to take 
John Mark with them. Now, Barnabas was related to John Mark, and he had a really a, kind of a vested interest in, in little Mark there and wanted to just see him grow for the Lord. Well, this was all good, and Barnabas, being the encourager, always saw the good in people, and, you know, just it was always going to be a blessing there. So here comes John Mark walking with Barnabas and Paul, and while they were in their hometown or home nation, really, Cyprus, they, it was fine, no problem. But now all of a sudden they got out on the boat and started to take these treks. John Mark's thinking to himself, what did I get myself into? I don't think John Mark really loved the world, but never found that. What we found, though, was he grew really kind of, I, I don't, I don't want to be too harsh here, but I, I think he got a little bit f- afraid, a little bit overwhelmed by the work of the Lord. And you can read all this in the book of Acts, but he, he decided he's going to go back. And I've heard people be kind of unkind and say, you know, he's going back to mama and all, I don't know, whatever. But here's the point. He decided he's going to leave Paul and Barnabas and head back. And I'm telling you what, for Paul, now Paul's one of these gritty guys. You know Paul, don't you? I mean, he's been stoned and shipped, not yet, but he's going to be. And uh, in the first, after the first journey here, and I'm telling you, he's just thinking to himself, if, man, Mark, if you can't even make it on a ship, ra- a, a ship uh, journey, how are you going to make it in the Lord's work? And I mean, it just bugged Paul to death. And, and really, the Bible says that the contention between Paul and Barnabas. Now, Barnabas saying, no, it's fine. Come on, let's bring him. This is later on when they, they wanted to go on another journey. And Paul's, Paul's saying, we need to go on a journey. And Barnabas said, let's take Mark again. And Paul's like, no way. It ain't happening. And Barnabas is sticking up for his relative. And Paul's you know, trying to say, no way, it's not happening. Paul, I think, saw something in Mark that needed to be addressed but it wasn't, Barnabas wasn't willing to address it. I don't know that Paul was being unkind. Again, I'm reading into all this, but the bottom line is the Bible says that the contention between Paul and Barnabas was so sharp that they ended up having to split ways. I'll tell you, I don't see the Apostle Paul having a church split, but it happened. Isn't that something? Now, it didn't stay that way, praise the Lord. I think it should never stay this way. But there was a contention so sharp between them, they had to split up. Paul took Silas, Barnabas took Mark, and they went off there. And we don't hear anything but from uh, Barnabas and, and uh, Mark for a long time. And then at the end of the passage in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and verse number 10, right at the end of Paul's life, do you see what he says? Bring Mark, because he's profitable for me, for the ministry. Here's what he's saying. I think Paul saw something, and I, I believe Mark repented, got that taken care of. God grew him and changed him, praise the Lord. And now Paul recognized to restore Mark back to a place of friendship and fellowship again is absolutely necessary. And I think that was a wonderful act Paul made of in his dying days of bringing back Mark into fellowship and fruitfulness for the Lord. As a matter of fact, we know that God used John Mark greatly later on. What am I saying? I'm saying there's a difference between Demas and Mark. I understand maybe we get, we get discouraged or maybe it's overwhelming or whatever. I understand that we never have the same problem in Mark that we had in Demas. Mark was restored because of his willingness to grow and to, and to love God and to continue on. Demas, never we never hear of him being restored. I, I don't, I'm not saying he wasn't saved. I'm not even saying he was a terrible man. I'm just saying he loved the world more than he loved God. Here's what, here's what the bottom line is. We could talk about Luke. Praise the Lord. May we have more Lukes. Luke just stayed there to the end. I mean, yeah, he never left. Praise the Lord. And I'm so thankful for people like that, you know? So maybe we could say it this way as we conclude this morning. You're in one of those three groups. We're either a Luke just faithful, loving God, never, never changing. Not perfect. I'm not saying you're never doing anything wrong. I'm just saying you love God, and you're going to put God first. And you're going to follow God's word. Praise the Lord. I'm so thankful for people like that. Such an encouragement. Maybe, maybe there's a mark that's, man, I'm just overwhelmed. I'm telling you, the work of God and living for God and doing all this for the Lord, that's just overwhelming to me. Not really able to grow. But then eventually coming to the point where maybe, okay, now I'm growing. I'm maybe taking that next step of, of faith, and maybe for you that may look like, um, I don't know, another commitment to the Lord, uh, further commitment in your life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read my Bible every day. I'm going to pray every day. I'm going to spend extended time seeking God every day. How many understand that's a big step of faith? And you ought to do it. I, I think it's shameful how little time we spend with the Lord. 
Maybe God's calling you to that step of faith as a John Mark. Maybe it's a further commitment to service for the Lord. And I want to serve God in His church. I want to be a, a part of it. I want, to, I want to step out by faith and I want to be a part of that and serve the Lord. Whatever the next step is, God's calling you to that step in your life. Maybe that's a John Mark or maybe, maybe there's a Demas. You got all the right clothes on and you say all the right things and you sing all the right songs and maybe you're doing all the right things, but you know your heart is not here. And I don't mean here in church. I just mean here together in God's service. Your heart's over there. May I say this? Just like a tree that falls in a storm reveals what was inside, doesn't it? If you look inside, wow, it's, this thing's rotten. And then you look on the outside and you're like, man, that big tree fell. Look at that. Oh, I see why. It's often the case, it's always the case with, with following the Lord. We learn as a people how to fit in and to put on and to keep up. But there's coming a day when the storm will come, whatever that is, the decision point. And the healthy oak tree that has true love, and I'm using this illustration kind of mixed metaphor here, but has a true love for God, they're going to stand that test. Those that have the love for the world, let me tell you, it'll be revealed. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, it's some big secret. I'm just saying let's not have that connection, that love for the world so great and a no love for God or a lack of love for God in that situation. Remember, I said you, you cannot serve two masters. You cannot have it both ways. The world's pathway does not run parallel to God's pathway. They run opposite directions. You can't love the world in some area and love God. You can't do it. That's the whole message from last week. And so the, the love of the world is a devastating thing. And I want to say again that the deceitfulness of Satan is that you somehow can love both. You can have it both ways. I want to tell you, that's exactly what he told Adam and Eve, in the, or told Eve in the garden. If you go back, his strategy has not changed over the last six to 8,000 whatever years, how many thousands of years it's been. Always saying, God doesn't know best. You could have it both ways. And it's the lie from Satan. So listen, if you would, as we close this morning. The truth really to be understood today is that you cannot be a follower of God and a follower of the world. I won't take you there, but 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 is really the classic verse about this. If you know it, you could say it with me. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if men love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And then listen to verse 17. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, that is all the desires, all the pursuits that we've been in, everything that we are seeking after to love. Here's what it looks like. I'm holding it with such a firm hand, and boy, I've gained so much, and I've got all of this accumulation, and one day, it's just going to turn to dust. Those achievements, those accolades, that wealth, those possessions, everything that we've done to dust. You say, Pastor, that's kind of a that's kind of cynical way to look at life. Listen, the fact is, we just said what is here, what we see, is temporary. It's going to pass away. But what we can't see is eternal. And so the Bible says then that we, we hold all these things, but they're going to pass away. That's what the word is, really, literally, change to dust, be gone. But he, listen to me, he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. I'm not saying that we do God's will so that we can go to heaven. That's not it at all. Salvation is finished and paid for. If you've accepted it, it's paid for, it's done. Hallelujah. What he's saying is that if we love God with all of our heart, in comparison or contrast to loving the world, we will, those things will abide forever. You know what abides forever? Your service for the Lord. You know what abides forever? Your relationships that are centered around the Lord's word. You know what abides forever? The investments we make in our children for eternity. And, and what we, the, the investments we make in eternity, period. 
That's a whole other message. What are you investing in? But the world will pass away. Paul represented a way of life that was eternal in perspective. He had given all for that one focus. And I'm not going to go back and read, but I want to tell you, Paul got to the end of his life after he said, I'm forsaking all these things. I count them as garbage. All of my achievements that I've had, they're garbage to me. I don't even need them that I may know him. And then when he got to the end of his life in chapter 4, verse 10, or before 8 and 9, he said, I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. I want to say this morning that God had, or Paul had a love for God that would not quit. He had not driven down the tent pegs in, his, uh, uh, in this uh, low land of earth. He was not in pursuit of the things of this world. His love dwelt elsewhere. It was eternal. Anyone who was near Paul understood and knew that he had his love placed in God. That's why Demas, who loved the world, just couldn't, couldn't stay there any longer. <laughs> I, I got to get away. And by the way, that's why eventually, if you love the world or I love the world, it's going to show. Eventually it'll show. And, and that's not a threat. I'm just saying it's going to come out. Let's just love God with our whole heart. Let's love him with our whole mind and strength. Demas could not get in line with that love. He decided that his life in Thessalonica was going to be better for him. All those who follow Christ, as Matthew Henry says, makes this world their passage and not their portion. I love that. What that means is, I'm not here to get what I can here. I'm here to prepare for eternity. Here's what somebody said one time. We work and work and work for I don't know, if, you, if you're a normal person, you work till you're 65 or 67 or now, I don't know, whatever Social Security tells you to work to. And uh, we work, work, and work. And if our life is represented, um, well, let's, let's take a rope that represents eternity. And let's say we have a 200-foot rope here. Uh, that's even too small. But let's say we have a 200-foot rope. And it's stretched around this auditorium and whatever. And, and we were to signify our life on that 200-foot rope, we would take about the first three quarters of an inch or even less. That's our life. Then you take that three quarters of an inch or even less and you take just a fraction of that, that's what we, that's what we retire. That's when we retire. I mean, just a tiny sliver of that. So you think about that for a minute. We take our whole life, that's only a little tiny of e bit of eternity, saving for and preparing for just a tinier sliver of life that's called retirement so we can live in ease and do whatever we're going to do. And then we pass away and we have nothing prepared for all of eternity. You talk about a hopeless life. That is the definition of a wasted life. Now, is it wrong to prepare for retirement? Absolutely not. I put money away every month. I'm in Social Security. I hope there's some left if I, once I get there. But here's what I'm saying. I'm not preparing for retirement. I, I'm, I'm preparing for it, but I'm not living for it. I'm living for something that's going to last a lot longer. Uh, it's not me. I'm not, I'm not, I don't have some secret. It's right there in the Bible. What are you going to love? What are you going to serve? The world passes away, and all the desires and achievements thereof. But he that doeth the will of the Father abideth forever. A poem that I'm just going to read, I think, fits this. The angels from their place on high look down on us with wondering eye. That where we are but passing guests, we build such firm and solid nests. But where we hope to live for a, we scarce take heed one stone to lay. To love the Lord and to serve it, excuse me, to love the world and to serve it above Christ will either be neither be satisfying nor profitable. Trust the scriptures today, trust what God's word says. And love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Young person, if I could tell you anything this morning, if I were to drop dead, and I knew it, if I was going to drop dead in the next five minutes, here's my last words to you this morning. Love God with all your heart, and you will never, ever regret it. Moms and dads, love God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Release anything of the world that you have a love for. I'm not saying you have to sell everything, give everything up. We're not moving into a monastery. That's not what I'm saying. Give up your love for it. Let it go. And serve God. Love Him with all your heart. And by the way, God gives us all those things 
that we desire. I stand here as a testament to that. I think you could probably ask anybody who's been saved and serving the Lord for any length of time, do you regret loving the Lord at any time in your life? Not one time. Let's pray together and have our heads bowed and eyes closed this morning. Lord, I feel so inadequate to be able to express the truth of the Word of God today. I only trust that the Holy Spirit would do His work in each heart. Lord, do that which we cannot do at all. Lord, as I'm only just one beggar giving another beggar some bread, you have to be the one, Lord, that really makes this meaningful and applicable in our life. Oh, Lord, I pray this morning that you would teach us and help us. Lord, there are people today that need to give up something, some love that they're holding on to, and they need to love you first and only in their life. Lord, there's things in my life, Lord, I know that can very easily come up and become a love over and above you. God, I pray that you would help us each, that we might give our hearts completely to you this morning. And God, would you help us to keep that firmly focused in our mind. Lord, we thank you for the illustration, though, Lord, I'm sorry for Demas' life, but I'm thankful for his illustration, his example to us, that we might learn. Help us, we pray. Lord, would you speak to each heart this morning. Do only, Lord, what they need individually, and may you do it in a very complete and loving way, I pray. Maybe there's someone here, Lord, that does not know you as Savior. They're questioning even their relationship with you personally. I pray that today might be the day of salvation. And Lord, would you do your work in their hearts. We thank you for your grace in Jesus' name. Would you join me standing, please? Your heads bowed and eyes closed today.